Grace and peace to you from God our Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, coming to you from a new setting here outside our uh, home here in um, Mitcham, uh, Melbourne, Australia, outside on our deck. Uh, you can see a little bit of the, the clouds behind us. It is, uh, I, I thought, appropriate to be outside today because uh, today is actually Ascension Day. Can you believe 40 days after uh, Easter Sunday when we celebrated the resurrection of our Lord? Uh, our Lord Jesus Christ appeared for 40 days and um, yeah, and on the 40th, he uh, went up into the air. So uh, if you can imagine uh, where we've come to and where the disciples were at at that point, this is where uh, we are today. Uh, I'm also in a different location because, uh, thank you for your feedback, I, apologies for the camera angle that was uh, not too good last week. Um, and some of you heard, I'm, I wrote uh, that I've actually been locked out of the church. Uh, the locks have been changed, literally, and uh, that's another story for another time. But uh, the Lord's Word is not locked, it's not chained, it's, it's free, and, and God intends it to be free, and freer than ever, uh, to be able to per fulfill the purposes that He has for us. So, um, just as a bit of an introduction to our theme for today, I, I've been reflecting on last words. Um, I've had the opportunity to have a few funerals, a couple funerals in the last couple of weeks. And uh, one person actually, in addition to that, whom I was able to literally prepare for dying. And, uh, and the last words that are, that are shared both uh, from the people as, as to the people, I think are, are sig particularly significant. We, we I think, uh, find it good to remember the last words. Um, Actually, I was uh, thinking of Eugene Peterson, who uh, wrote, uh, wrote uh, and about him was written, among his last words were, let's go, which suggests his anticipation and perhaps a glimpse of the beauty and eternal delight set before him. So it's not only the last words that, that others have spoken that are, are significant, let's go, uh, well, where, as well as the words that we hear uh, other, spe uh, other people speak to us. And I, I don't think it's any coincidence, having done pastoral ministry for several years now, that um, as I understand it, the last of our five senses to actually go is, is our hearing. And I think God has designed it that way because faith comes by hearing. And even though a person might be unconscious, unconscious the hearing is the last to go. To give uh, each one of us the, the, every opportunity to come to faith and to know where we are going in, into the life um, beyond. So because the scriptures say faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of God. So... Today we look at the last words of Jesus, literally the last words that he spoke to the church, to, to us, his disciples, before he ascended into heaven. And this really is a transitional day, um, thinking not only of coronavirus, uh, where we were at Easter and just before that I was planning to be in Latvia, the, the, the amount of change that's taken place. Well, the same was happening in Jesus' uh, disciples' lives, the same thing is happening to us as well. So we read these last words. Words. Uh, actually, and before the last words, even a preface, uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 2, just before he ascended into heaven, he, that is Jesus, left instructions for the apostles he had chosen by the Holy Spirit. Those words, he left instructions or commands to his disciples uh, before he left. And, 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 and then we'll look at those today and we'll pray before we do that. Gracious Father, we pray that you would open our ears to hear the words that you are wanting to say to us through your word, through your last words, to us, to the church, and as well to many others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I've typically summarized what I believe are the three main words that Jesus left with the church before he ascended into heaven on the 40th day. Number one, don't overthink it. This is from Acts chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. It is not for you to know. 
In other words, don't overthink this thing. I think one of the greatest challenges that Western Christianity faces, particularly after the Enlightenment, uh, is that we overthink things. We are overly cerebral in our faith understanding. And this was the problem of the disciples as well. They thought they'd figured it out. They, they, they put this question to the Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Jesus says, that's not for you to know. I think of uh, verses of scripture like Proverbs 3, chapter, uh, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Uh, through two friends of mine, through pastors, uh, they highlighted another verse of scripture that I haven't meditated on upon as much, but I think it's very uh, relevant to this particular point. Deuteronomy 29:29. 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. There are secret things that only belong to God, and even the things that he reveals to us are things that he has revealed, and we are not to overthink them. Uh, anyway, point there. Uh, reflecting on my own life, uh, IUPUI, Indiana University, Purdue University, uh, Indiana is the university that I uh, graduated from. And actually, actually I did, after I did, I continued taking evening courses there even as I was working full time. And I'll never forget the day, uh, right fresh out of, with my Bachelor of Science degree, uh, that I was walking through the halls in the evening at the university and these words, you've probably heard me share these before, but they're quite relevant to today's, this point particularly. So that your faith might not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. And I remember those words hitting me because my faith was resting upon the wisdom of men. It was resting on my own understanding. It was resting upon what other people uh, had taught me and were continuing to teach me. And, uh, and, and my faith was firmly planted, I would say, there. The flip side of that, the power of God, I knew little to nothing about. And it was like God was pulling me up saying, Aldi, don't rely on your own understanding. My faith journey back into Christianity began with people like C.S. Lewis and, and John Stott. C.S. Lewis, who uh, wrote the, the book Mere Christianity, the classic, and, and I remember he was one of the first ones that uh, impressed upon me that I could actually be a thinking Christian, but it was thinking in a different way than I, that I, was, than I was used to. Uh, recently, I read uh, C.S. Lewis's uh, biography, and, he, and a, a particular uh, description impressed itself upon me. He described uh, this thinking that I'm really, and, and I believe God is pulling up us, uh, us up about, as chronological snobbery. And, and I, I was plagued with chronological snobbery back, uh, back in, in, in that time because I, I thought because I had the newest, best education, I, I believe, that I could have had or many could have had at that time in life, and people believe that to this day, therefore I was a bit of a snob towards what uh, people had known and shared and, and, and even what God had revealed before. I was, getting a, I was getting a new enlightened understanding of these things, not realizing how actually lost and blind and dumb I was. Uh, John Stott in Basic Christianity writes about a, a young student who um, came to him after going to university in Oxford or something like that and, and said he couldn't any longer recite the Apostles' Creed because it conflicted with his understanding. And I, and I remember uh, John Stott spoke to him and said, well, if I could answer every one of your intellectual questions, would you be willing to change your life? And this young student kind of blushed and, and walked away because, the, as John Stott points out, his problem wasn't intellectual, it was actually moral. It was this idea of who is actually going to run your life. And we so often use our intellect as a way of controlling our own lives as well as the lives of others. So I think, believe the first point that Jesus would impress upon us on ascension is don't overthink it. Don't rely on your own understanding. Secondly, he says, get dressed with power. Get dressed or clothed with power. Jesus' last words in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, are, Behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the, in the city until you are clothed with power on high. That was the second part of that verse. verse. Do not let your faith rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. 
Jesus' last words upon earth before he ascended are in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where he says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. I'm not big on emphasizing the Greek or the original languages, but there are some words that particularly hold a lot of punch for me. And this is literally one of those words. The word for power in the original Greek is dunamis. And the word dunamis is the word from which we get the word dynamite. And so what Jesus is actually saying is you will receive dynamite in your life when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Dynamite is powerful. It's life-transforming stuff. It's like what, it's, it's what Paul describes in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Jesus says you will be clothed in that power. Paul says that that is what our faith is supposed to rest upon or rely upon or count upon. Not what's up here, but what's in here. Eugene Peterson writes, um, The gospel is concerned not with enlightenment, but with encounter. Not just envisioning the light and power of God in Jesus Christ, but with experiencing it. And in experiencing it to be transformed by it. Again, my needing to learn to not rely on my understanding led me on a journey to seek the power of God. What does that actually mean? Actually, that, that verse I've mentioned before was an advertisement for a, for a university student uh, small group. And, and, and I remember God drawing me there, even though I didn't know a soul there, I went. And that led me to just continue to, to follow along the path that led me to discover what, what and how I might get this power that... Um, God was promising. The reality of power and experience is you know it when you have it. And if you don't, I'm encouraging you to seek it, to look for it, to find it, to ask for it, to knock, to, to go out of your way. Sometimes you have to get out of the boat that you're comfortable in, to, in in order to find it. But I believe Scripture again and again encourages us to do that. Be clothed with power from on high and don't leave home without it. And then finally and thirdly, the message of ascension is be my martyrs. And sometimes in the world, uh, we hear people say, don't be a martyr. Well, actually the Bible says be a martyr, but be a martyr for Christ, not for yourself or for anything else. Jesus said, I promise you this, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be filled with power and you will be my messengers. Again, one of those original Greek language words. The word is martyre, which is the word from which we get the word martyr. Someone who's willing to sacrifice their lives for a greater cause. You will be my martyrs to Jerusalem, throughout Judea, the distant provinces, and even to the remotest places on earth. That is the plan, to be martyrs, to be witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. Jerusalem is where you live. Judea is where you shop and get away maybe for a weekend. The ends of the world is where you travel further abroad. For me, the ends of the world brought me to Australia. I never would have imagined. I want to uh, close, well, I'm not quite close. Well, yeah, I, I do want to close actually with the words from Simon Ponsonby, this book called More, which is uh, a theme that... Uh, runs through and through my life. And actually, the subtitle is How You Can Have More of the Spirit When You Already Have Everything in Christ. Uh, he, in his final chapter, interestingly, not coincidentally, begins uh, with a section called The Place of the Skull. And he actually writes here, Luther taught us that we must not substitute a theology centered on glory for the primacy of the, a, a theology centered on the cross. In fact, it is not an either-or, but an indivisible both-and. The spirit of glory leads us to the cross, from which is released the spirit of glory. And uh, this chapter is worth its weight in gold. This book is one I would, uh, again, recommend. It's, it's a beautifully written uh, book. He, was a, he actually is, uh, was a chaplain in Oxford, uh, where C.S. Lewis studied for a while. But again, I'll just read the beginning of this section called Back to the Cross. The spirit-filled Christian will constantly be drawn to the cross. The person who lives and loves the cross will constantly be drawn to a deeper understanding and experience of the spirit. 
There is a mutual, reciprocal, and indivisible relationship between the cross and spirit. This is the Christian criterion for our theology, our ministry, and our spirituality. This is the Christian cycle. Being led from the cross to a deeper life in the spirit which leads us back to a deeper identification with Christ at the cross. That the, is the plan, that we be filled, we be clothed with the power of the Holy Spirit, and that we be God's witnesses to the ends of the earth. We read the response of the disciples that they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. This is the way the gospel according to Luke ends. And we read what happens a few verses after Jesus rose up into heaven somewhere, you can imagine on the day, somewhere in the clouds when he disappeared. There's still like a lot of the church, I think, looking up into heaven. And God pulls them up and says, don't, st don't, don't keep looking up there. Look inside where Jesus dwells and where I want the Holy Spirit to dwell in more power and fullness within each one of you and within the whole church. So we read how they returned to Jerusalem and they went up to the upper room and all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. If there's two quick keys I could, I could just share with you and I'll unpack some other time for experiencing the fullness of God. One is surrender, which is the way of the cross, and the second is prayer, which is actively praying and trusting and believing that God will fulfill the promises that he has given to us. And so today I want to end by praying with you the prayer that is from part of our um, epistle reading for today, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 to 19. But as with most of the prayers in the Bible, pray to make it your prayer. A person. This is Paul's prayer for us, but his prayer for us is meant to be our prayer for ourselves. And, uh, and I pray that we can join in together on this day of Pentecost and, and, and pray this way. Let us pray. I pray that the Father of glory, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, would impart to me the riches of the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation to know him through my deepening intimacy with him. I pray that the light of God will illuminate the eyes of my imagination, flooding me with light until I experience the full revelation of the hope of his calling, that is, the wealth of God's glorious inheritances that he finds in us, his holy ones. And I pray that I will continually experience the immeasurable greatness of God's power made available to me through faith. Then my life will be an advertisement of this immense power as it works through me. And as Jesus taught us to pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. And a blessed ascension and countdown to Pentecost to you. Amen. <laughs>